So thanks everyone for coming. This is our fall semester um, thesis, uh, robo MSc thesis presentation. Uh, so we technically have two presenters today. Um, well, you know, hopefully, uh, so I think Yu Chen should be joining us shortly. Um, so here, here's um, the general structure. Um, so Shiani Patel will be our first speaker, and each of our speakers will be given 15 minutes. We'll have uh, five minutes for Q&A. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep track of the time. Shiani, I'm just going to give you a countdown when we hit uh, the three minute mark. And so if you just keep an eye on the chat, you know, sort of on your little chat window, um, any, you know, if something pops up, it, it's, you know, just me kind of counting down. Um, so without further ado, Shani, whenever you're ready, go ahead um, and you have the floor. All right, can you guys see my, my screen? Yes. Awesome, all right. Hello everyone, I will be talking about Vector Graph Neural Network, BGNN for short. It is a pipeline for predicting point clouds. To begin this presentation, I will show you a GIF. This GIF shows a robot stacking box. This tells us that the robot is able to make confident predictions on the object and the environment. In broad screen, this ability to predict is important because it allows a robot to confidently do a task in an unforeseen environment. There exists a lot of predictive pipelines. Then why is VGNN different? Well, we are bringing in equivariance with respect to rotation. So equivariance is the ability of a network to relate the object with applied transformation, in our case, rotation, uh, as the same thing as applying transformation to the upright output. So in the left column, you see the network has predicted the future scene for the upright, upright stack. And the right, you you see that it has made prediction on the rotated stack as well. And you and on the bottom, you see that it has been able to correlate this information. Like it has been able to tell that the upright stack, when rotated, is the same as the rotated stack. So I did say there are a lot of predictive pipelines today that have si significantly improved prediction accuracy. So let's talk about them. We start with SE3 PostNet. It learns a low dimensional post embedding for visual motor control. The novelty introduced by them was their dynamic model. This model explicitly learns to segment salient parts and predict their post embedding along with their motion, which is modeled as a change in post space due to their applied action. Then we have the object centric video prediction without annotation, OPA. It is successful in predicting future frames given a context frame. It relies on priors from powerful computer vision models. The deep visual foresight for planning robot motion is a robust mo model predictive pipeline that is supervised and uses video action and safe space. So you see the little uh, green dots. And lastly, we have the interaction network. Um, they presented a pipeline that can be generalized based on the object and relation centric reasoning. All of these works have brought novelty to predictive modeling, but they also rely on information from the environment. We designed VGNN to be a more general pipeline. And I will show you the overview of VGNN. We take in the RGBD image as input, convert it to point cloud using the standard camera intrinsic matrix, and send it to our model for predicting point clouds for future frames. We are using chamfer distance as our choice of loss. I will explain in the next few slides the thought process that went into making all these um, blocks. To start off, we have enforcing equivariance with respect to rotation, as it is the main objective of VGNN. We use vector neurons representation that extends 1D scalar to 3D vector. This is important because the 3D vector will now be able to preserve rotation on each point's XYZ positional coordinate in the point cloud. To the left is the mapping of 1D scalar to 3D vector, and to the right is the feature vector aligning itself to the learn direction K for the nonlinearity. Now that we have covered how VGNN tackles equivariance with respect to rotation, we will move on to the structure that we used for building VGNN. To this end, we used graph convolution network with K nearest neighbor. The message passing in the graph convolution network shares aggregated information with its neighbor defined by K to predict the future position of points in the predicted point cloud. 
which helps us create a pipeline that doesn't rely on any outside information, rather just focuses on the point cloud itself. Now that I've covered equivariance with respect to rotation and a generalized prediction task, I will move on to a more detailed view of VGNN. So here is the network pipeline. The network takes in point cloud created from RGBD image and transformed it to data representation needed for graph convolution network, which is then passed through a series of hidden layers with linearity followed by non-linearity up until the very last layer. And the last layer is composed of linear layers and message passing, which then outputs the predicted point cloud. I said, the over, I said in the overview of BGNN that we are using chamfer distance as our loss function. I will now show you why we are doing that. So chamfer distance measures the similarity between two point clouds, point cloud one and point cloud two, like so, and vice versa. It is useful because it is spatially differentiable for n points in the point cloud and also efficient with respect to forward and backward propagation. I have theoretically explained all the concepts that went into building VGNN. Now I will show you how the experiments were set up. We designed two sets of experiments, one for testing the equivariance with respect to rotation and one for testing the prediction accuracy. For this, we experimented with variation of network um, variations of VGNN, such as making them deeper and wider. The key hyperparam for us was the K, as it is vital in aggregating information based on point P on the, uh, and the neighbors. Uh, for the actual setup, we used the ShapeSec data set that was simulated by Ox Oxford, simulated by Oxford University. In this data set, we got information about the scene from 16 camera views in the RGBD format. This helps us create the point cloud. We wanted to use point clouds that is a very common uh, representation for 3D data set. And 3D data set gives you more information on the scene than a 2D data set as the world is in 3D. For solidifying VGNN's ability to, to be equivariant with respect to rotation, we created an overfit model that trained on data set on the left and tested on the data set on the right, which is the same data set, but rotated 90 degrees. So here, the training curves are extremely similar to each other. But when you look at the test curve, it seems like VGNN has no error. And this is because, and when you look at the detailed view, you see that VGNN actually has an error of 7.3 times 10 raised to negative 4, while GCN has the error for 2.01, which is drastically different. This is because VGNN's property for equivariance with respect to rotation has helped it relate the upright stack with the rotated stack. This is the qualitative view, and you see that the uh, input point cloud is the blue point cloud. This is time step one, and this is time, to, time step two. In time step, in both these time steps for VGNN, the predicted point cloud, which is in red, uh, kind of is on top of the uh, ground truth point cloud, the green one. Whereas for GCN, it is trying very hard to mimic that action, but is unable to. And this all is because VGNN has the ability to be uh, equivalent with respect to rotation. As for the prediction task, we, we did this test on the full data set, so standard model data set. And we found out that VGNN with five layers and 64 input channel produced the best prediction. Next, we did the same test, but this time we rotated the test data set by 90 degrees to, to show that it were uh, the to show that our network was able to predict accurately, accurately on the full data set as well as maintain the property of equivariance with respect to rotation. And yet again, the vector graph neural network of five layers and 64 input channel was the best. In conclusion, I was able to prove all the claims that I made in the beginning of the presentation in terms of our network being able, uh, being equivalent to rotation and giving better prediction overall while also just relying on the information of the point cloud itself. Questions? Thank you. I see there. Great, thank you. And we have a question from Dinesh. Dinesh, go ahead. Hey, Shani, thanks for the nice talk. Um, Hello. I wanted to check about um, a little question that came up, which is, uh, I mean, obviously I understand that the demonstration here is intended as like a, a demonstration of the abilities of the network. Mm -hmm. um, 
But of course, in an actual scene, if the you know if the table had been flipped aside, the prediction would be dramatically different because you you know you have a uh, the gravity is always kind of invariant, right? So gravity would be pushing objects in a different way uh, mm -hmm. if you if you had the table flipped this way. So the, the actual thing I assume that you're uh, that you're targeting is if you were seeing a view of the scene flipped this way, right? Rather than like this, right? So meaning a three D rotation rather than just an in plane rotation of your current view, mm -hmm. right? Um, so does this network, do you know if the network already handles this? Or given that it's built on vector neuron, which is supposed to uh, be equivalent to SO3 already? Yeah, we are we are assuming that like it should, but we are also in the, currently running more experiments on this. So I will get to you gotcha. when I get concrete results on that specific okay. experiment. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Great. Any other questions? OK, let's thank Shiani again. Thank you. Thank you. And then I see you, Chen. Uh, you, Chen, you want to try sharing your screen? Yes. Oh. oh. Um, I can. You, all you should be able to now. OK. Yeah. So let me share my screen. Oh. Can you okay. can see my screens now? Yes. Okay. So I will give you a, a countdown starting, uh, you know, when you have three minutes left, when you have two minutes left, and when you have one minute left. So it's 15 minutes, right? Okay. Um, and then I'm, so just keep an eye on the chat. So if something pops up, uh, that's, you, that's probably me um, giving you the, the countdown. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so Yu Chen Sung is our next speaker, and she's going to be telling us about repeated jumping with a rebound, a self-writing jumping robot, leveraging bistable origami-inspired design. Yu Chen, whenever you're ready, go ahead and uh, take the floor. Okay. So hi, folks. Today I'm going to present my master thesis titled Repeated Jumping with the Rebound, Self-Writing Jumping Robot Leveraging Bistable Origami-Inspired Design. Um, so what is a rebound? Rebound is a jumping robot that you spring like ribble at its body. It is up as a frame and jumping mechanisms. Um, the four independent servo motors serve as the actuator. When the horn pull up, the rebound is compressed and ready for jump. Um, so the ribble stores and release potential string energy in its pattern. Um, and the jump height is controlled via the four patterns design parameters. The previous rebound is able to jump to a certain height with the with this simple actuation, but it fails to um, control the takeoff and landing, and it also fails to jump repeatedly. To achieve repeated jumping, despite um so. Despite of jumping to a certain height, the robot should also change the direction of jumping and recover from any landing position. And here is the video of our final design. Um, let me, yeah. So the contributions of the thesis include the new actuation method, um, the design of self-writing mechanism, the dynamic models for actuation and self-writing, uh, the experiments that verify the dynamic models. Finally, a new rebound that can repeatedly jump in is presented in this video. So generally, there are two kinds of self-writing method. The first one is the passes method by changing the robot shape or shift the center of the mass. Um, and another method is active method. It can achieve by add a actuated parts to push the robot against the ground. And another method is to is a aerial appendage that can reorientate the robot in area. Um, 
So here is the design overview of our new evacuation method. Um, this picture shows the, sorry. So um, this picture shows the new evacuation method. Compression begins with the motor turning counterclockwise, which pulls the nut up. Once it is compressed, the motor turns clockwise and pushes the nut down until it jumps. Um, so an uh, IMU is added to the top of the ribbon to estimate the posture, and we also in implement the complementary filter to obtain a more precise detection. And here are the parameters we use for the new rebound. So to achieve self-writing, a combination of the active and passive method is used. The self-writing legs and the body acts like a four-bar linkage system. When compressing, the bottom self-writing leg generate force to push the body lifts the ground and the center of the mass moves close to the pivot. When the center of the mass pass a critical angle phi C, uh, it then self right as a result of gravity. Um, assume that the robot is rotationally symmetric and the self writing legs are all rigid. Um, if the entire robot is surrounded by the legs, the robot will self right if it passes the critical angle and the relationship between the um, bottom self writing legs, the top self writing leg, and phi follows the cosine law. If the, if the phi can exceed phi c, the number of legs can be reduced um, by this formula. And fin finally, the minimum number of legs can be uh, eliminated to this value. Um, and here is the geometry feasible range of the self-writing legs and the minimum number of legs that can be used to self-write. Um, larger values of the phi max occurs for larger value of phi t and smaller values of lb and phi minutes should be as small as possible to minimize the total volume of the ribbon. Typically, the optimal values for self-writing occurs at the upper left corner, that is LB, LT equals 2876 respectively, so that the ribbon will have the minimum volume and the maximum self-writing magnitude. So for the dynamical model of actuation, the behavior of the ribbon pattern is predicted using a pseudo region model consisting of a um, a linear spring and a pair of torsional spring. In the previous work, the model does match the behavior of the robot well when the pattern is highly compressed because the faces of the pattern come in contact. So a contact term here is added to augment the mechanics. Basically, the ribble pattern is bistable, but the property is not shown in the compressive curve and hysterias is observed between the compression and the tension curve. Um, this is likely because the deformation for compression and tension are not the same. During compression, both sides of the ribble bend, but during tension, only the bottom face bend. Um, Next is the model of rebound self-writing. To simplify the dynamical model of the rebound, um, a few assumptions are made. First, the mass of a self-writing leg is ignored, but all the mass of the self-writing legs are added to the top rebound. Um, and the rebound self-write about this fixed pivot, um, then the dynamic model of ribbon self-writing is built upon the Euler-Lagrange equation. Um, there are two stages during self-writing. In the first stage, the bottom legs, um, the bottom leg contacts with the ground, and the height of the ribbon and the angle between the robot and the ground are not independent. They are related by these two constraints. And in the second stage, um, 
the bottom leg left the ground. And in this case, the height of the rebound and the angle between the robot and the ground are independent. Mm. Finally, the Euler-Lagrange equation is built upon the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the constraint in the first and the second stage. Um, the final part is to verify the new design and the dynamical model by experiments. The experiments are carried on the OptiTrack motion capture system. The tracking frequency is 120 frames per second with 10 cameras. Um, the, the rigid body of the rebound is defined as a unique collateral in this figure. Um, for self-writing, uh, we attach a marker on the tip of the self-writing leg. Um, when the robot is fall down on the ground, this marker is cannot be seen by any of the camera. But once the robot starts self-writing, this marker becomes um, visible. And we mark the moment when this when this marker become visible uh, as the starting time of self-writing. First, uh, for the experiment first, we test the self-writing performance on different number of legs. Um, the parameter chosen is the theoretical optimal point, that is uh, LBLT equals 2876 millimeters. Um, so for, for this set of parameters, self-writing should succeed as long as the number of legs exists for. In reality, the self-writing succeed with um, 60, 16. And A legs. Uh, but it fails with four legs. I think the main reason is that the self-writing legs are not rigid enough to generate enough force uh, for to push the robot against the ground. Um, next, um, we test the self-writing performance on different leg lengths when the number of legs equals eight. The leg lengths were chosen um, um, were chosen along the leftmost five minute contour. Theoretically, these three sets of parameters should succeed with uh, eight legs, but but the one with um, but the one. But the one with um, this set of parameters fails. Um, because, because the self-writing magnitude is not enough for the robot to pass the critical state. Uh, when we compute the feasible range of self-writing parameters, we assume that the rebound will be compressed to its minimum height. However, when we fabricate the rebound, we experimentally determine that the rebound stop compressing itself when it snaps into the uh, compressed state to prevent the DC motor from stalling. And finally, we test the jumping and self-writing performance versus the prediction. Uh, when there is no lag mounted on the robot, the average maximum jump height is 75 millimeters. The jump height decreases as more legs added to the robot, but there is a very small gap between the jump height when the number of legs equals four and when the number of legs equals eight. So we determined that the, the, the best number of legs should be eight. And next we test the self-writing time as shown in 
plot B, the experimental self-writing time matches the simulation. Um, but in reality, the robot self-write faster than the simulation. I think it is due to the compliance of the self-writing lag. And we also observe from plot B that the self-writing lag with the optimal lags, that is the blue, that is the blue line, um, perform much stable um, than the least optimal one that is the green line. And from plot C, we, um, we test the angle between the self-writing lag and the ground against time. Uh, so from the beginning, the self-writing self lag contact with the ground and, and, and at the time it leaves the ground. So and the, and the robot um, become goes to its upright position be before the robot is fully compressed. Yeah. So in conclusion, um, in my master thesis, uh, self-writing by stable design for the rebound jumping robot is, um, is proposed. And we use a new actuation method and we design the self-writing mechanism and and there is a dynamical model for the self-writing and we, and we verified the new design and the dynamical models by experiment. And in the future, and in the future um, we hope we can learn more about why there are lots of jump height in the new design. Um, and we wish to, build a far more precise 3D dynamic home self-writing model because we observe some rotation along the robot's um, bottom edge. And, and with this far more precise dynamic home model, we can, um, we can have a close loop control of the self-writing so that we can precisely control the opening magnitude. And finally, we might have, we might, uh, add a directional jumping function to the robot. Um, that's all. Any questions or comments? Let's thank our presenter. Do we have any questions from the audience? So Yu Chen, is there a reason why you are focusing on having an even number of self-writing lengths? Is there a possibility to consider an odd number of self-writing legs? Um, because so, so let me go back to. Let me go back to this slide. So the in the the number of columns we chose is sixteen and. And, and the parameters we choose here ensure that uh, the robot is bistable. So because we didn't know when the when the robot is fell down, we didn't know which edges will touch the ground. So we just to make sure that the mass is distributed uh, evenly on the on the robot. So we so we use even number of self writing legs instead of the odd number. But if the but if the robot's body are built from an old number of rebel, and we might consider using a, an old number of self-writing legs. Great, thank you. Any other questions um, from the audience? Okay, so let's thank our presenters again. And so that uh, concludes our fall uh, 2021 presentation of our Robo MSc uh, thesis. So thank, thanks again to Shiani and Yu Chen uh, for their presentations.